So hello and welcome to this UKIRK Public Engagement Observatory webinar on mapping public engagement with energy, climate change and net zero. In this webinar, we're going to be presenting the observatory's major new analysis of public engagement with energy, climate change and net zero in the UK. And this is going to be followed by a panel discussion. My name is Jason Chilvers. I'm a co-director of UKIRK and I'm also uh, the lead on our public engagement observatory. The outline of today's webinar is as follows. After this opening introduction, I'm going to hand over to Phidias Stephanides from our public engagement observatory, who's going to present the key findings from our recent analysis. Before handing over to our panelists today, Claire Melia and Patrick Devine Wright, to offer their perspectives. And we'll then open up to a panel discussion and take some questions from the audience as well. So I'm conscious that uh, some of you joining uh, might not know about our public engagement observatory, UKIRK's public engagement observatory. It's a core cap capability of the UK Energy Research Centre, Centre funded by the UK Research Councils, UKRI. And in a previous briefing and webinar, we set out how the observatory is pioneering a new systemic approach to public engagement that goes beyond mainstream focus on say, communicating to the public or inviting publics to participate in discrete one-off engagement processes. So the Public Engagement Observatory maps the many different ways that uh, people are engaging with energy, climate change and net zero on an ongoing basis. And it openly shares and experiments with and undertakes these mappings with others to help make energy and climate related decisions, innovation and participation more just, responsible and responsive to society. And the observatory is based in our 3S research group at the University of East Anglia. And we have a team which includes myself, Helen Pallett, Tom Hargreaves, Phidias Stephanides, and Elliot Honeybon Arnolder. And the observatory has three strands of research and activity. We develop and carry out new methods like comparative case analysis, crowdsourcing, and digital methods that map diverse public engagement to energy and climate change on an ongoing basis. We have a network that makes connections and encourages learning across wider systems of public engagement in the UK and internationally. And today's webinar is, uh, is an example of uh, one of these activities. And we're also undertaking a series of collaborative experiments with partner organizations where we're exploring how novel approaches to mapping public engagement and the new evidence produced here uh, can make a difference to policy innovations and new forms of participation in practice. So today we're focusing on our mapping work, uh, lots of other activities going on within the observatory, but today we're presenting the key findings of a mapping of public engagement with energy, climate change and net zero uh, that's occurred between 2015 and 2022. And we published uh, these, these results, these findings in a briefing that came out just before the summer break. And um, there's a QR code there. If you want to scan that, you can take you directly to uh, the briefing. And so without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Phidias, who's going to take us through the findings of the analysis. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here today. So let's cut to the chase and so we're talking about the actual findings of our mappings of diverse forms of public engagement with energy, climate change, and net zero. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll try to give you an overview of some of the key findings of our analysis. And then I'll be handing over to Jason and our two other panelists, who will start reflecting on the implications of our analysis and provide their responses as well. But before presenting our actual findings, it is also critically important uh, to provide you with some background information on the method uh, we actually used. Basically, our latest mapping are, are taking forward the comparative case analysis method uh, developed in our previous UKIRK research. This method 
the comparative case analysis method that is, involves documentary analysis of diverse cases of public engagement to map how people are engaging, who is involved, what they are engaging in, and where amongst other categories. These methods, as you can see through the slide, comprises of five key steps. Initially, uh, we undertook a scoping analysis of key framings of low carbon transitions in significant contemporary statements and documents from policy and civil society organizations. We use this to update the framing and search terms used. During a second stage, we sought feedback from representatives of UKIRC and the Observatories Advisory Group to ensure we're actually using appropriate search terms that weren't excluding any emerging forms of public engagement. During the third stage, we undertook systematic searches using the search terms and a range of synonyms on academic and non-academic search engines, including, for instance, Web of Knowledge, Scopus, Google Scholar, Google, and Ecosia. This was done, basically, in order to identify cases of public engagement from across the academic literature, gray literature, and media. The comparative case mapping method attempts to diversity through a very open definition of public engagement as collective practices to which public engage in addressing collective public problems. In this specific case, energy and climate change related issues. We screened in cases that met this definition that reflected the diversity and patterns of public engagement identified in the searches that took place in the UK between 2015 and 2022, and obviously that had enough documentary evidence to allow case study analysis. In other words, a key principle of this method is to attend to diversity in mapping the many different forms of public engagement that exist, and we're not in any way or form claiming to represent all engagements happening out there. During a the fourth stage, we undertook initial qualitative coding analysis of 284 case studies that were shortlisted to establish the who, the how, the what, and the where of each case of public engagement. The coding structure was jointly created and tested on a sample of cases by the research team to ensure intercoded intercoder reliability. Finally, we conducted some additional fine-grained case study analysis to gain an even better and deeper understanding of the diverse cases of public engagement, their productivities in terms of public views and actions, and also the interrelations uh, between them. We would now like to show you some key highlights from our most recent mapping of UK public engagement with energy and climate change. And if we could move on to the next slide, thank you, Jason. So in this figure here, we've basically tried to plot and thematically cluster all of our cases on two main axes, one ranging from institution to citizen-led forms of engagements, and one ranging from discursive to action-oriented engagement. First and foremost, against a common view that public engagement with energy and climate change is lacking, an overarching, a key finding of our mapping is that publics are already engaged with these issues in multiple and diverse ways. As shown in this slide, public engagements with energy and climate change are highly diverse, ranging from those which are institution-led to those that are citizen-led, and from those which are more about expressing public views to those that are more action-oriented. Invited institutional-led forms of participation on the left-hand side of this figure are more dominant and widespread, revealing in this way systemic inequalities in the kinds of public engagement that get emphasized. Forms of elicitation, including public opinion surveys, focus groups, and interviews are by far the most dominant way through which government, business, academics, and civil society organizations alike seek public views on energy, 
climate change and net zero related issues. Moreover, a range of existing and emerging forms of environmental engagements have also sought to represent public views, including amongst others, a large number of deliberative and public dialogue processes, as seen, for instance, through the rise of national and local citizens' assemblies, through as well to formal political processes, including consultations. Institution led engagements that are more action oriented included communication campaigns, behavior change initiatives, and economic instruments. Importantly, though, a crucial finding of this mapping is the need to go significantly beyond these institution-led engagements. Our analysis captures the prevalence of engagements that are citizen-led and uninvited, which I account for around one-third of the case that is in the overall corpus. And this can be found on the right-hand side of this figure. Specifically, a number of citizen-led cases see publics debating energy and climate change issues, developing alternative visions of sustainable futures, and also challenging existing policies. This includes forms of activism, protests, artistic engagements, and the use of digital spaces and social media. And as shown at the bottom right corner of the mapping space in this figure, our mappings also included instances of bottom-up series and action and innovation, taking, for instance, the form of community action and community energy groups, uh, maker and hacker spaces, and energy poverty action groups. Now, when comparing the current mapping with the results of our previous analysis that focused on the period between 2010 and 2015, helps highlight that public engagement with energy and climate change is never static, being continually ongoing, emerging, and in flux. Specifically, our analysis traces some important changes between the two research phases. Firstly, the forms of public engagement have become further diversified in the recent period, with some new and emerging forms of participation becoming evident including, amongst others, narrative-based engagement, technology demonstrations, and technology domestication, and uninvited forms of consumer action. Secondly, we see a sharp rise in visible instances of citizen-led activism and protest compared to the previous period. This includes more localized protests, challenging energy infrastructure developments, like fracking and renewables through to the rise of activism, activism. In the case of Extinction Rebellion, for instance, and protests by Fridays for Future. All this emphasize direct action and campaigning to bring about broader political and social change, a theme that is far more prominent in the current phase of mapping. Thirdly, our analysis uncovers the continuation of the deliberative turn, which gained increased relevance in relation to climate change, particularly through the mainstreaming of citizen assemblies by governments and groups in civil society at local and national levels and throughout the world as well. The rise of citizen assemblies is, of course, closely tied as well to the demands of activist groups like the Extinction Rebellion, which highlights in this way how many forms of engagement interrelate with each other. Fourthly, cases relating to everyday practices and to the integration of new technologies into everyday life are more prominent in the current mapping compared to the earlier space. The number of these everyday forms of engagement has more than doubled in the current phase of mapping. And this partly reflects increased interest in social practice theory approaches within scholarly sec uh, sectors, as well as behavior change initiatives being less prominent in the current analysis. Finally, and in spite of these changes, it is important 
to highlight that some forms of engagement still remain dominant in the wider ecology of participation, especially public opinion surveys. They were dominant in the period between 2010 and 2015, and they still remain a dominant feature of this uh, increasingly diversified field of public engagement as well. Now, when focusing on the who of public engagement, our mapping demonstrates that there is no single public in relation to energy, climate change, and net zero, as some engagement approaches often assume. Those engaging with these issues are plural publics, ranging from lay publics, aggregate populations, consulted publics, consumers and users, through to special interest groups, affected publics, active citizens, active communities, activists, and so on and so forth. Attempts to represent an aggregate population by selecting a statistically representative sample of the public according to key demographic characteristics continues to be a dominant framing of the public, especially in public opinion survey cases. The tendency is for individual surveys to claim a definitive representation of the public in the UK or of a particular segment of the population. This is also the case in many deliberative processes where participants are typically framed in terms of lay publics or innocent citizens with no predefined interests in a specific issue, including, for instance, Climate Assembly UK, which claimed to offer a definitive representation of the UK public as a whole and of their views in terms of getting to net zero by 2050. However, no matter how inclusive or representative an individual engagement process seeks to be, we argue that there will always be other publics and already existing forms of participation that it doesn't include. Other framings of publics also offer reduced roles for citizens. For example, visions of publics as consumers or users still remain prevalent and durable, both of which potentially limit the range of ways through which people can legitimately participate, giving primacy to direct engagements with the market or as users of services and technologies such as energy related technologies in the home. In other cases, publics are framed in terms of an audience that is communicated to and as consulted publics who respond to fixed predefined proposals. Importantly though, Against this backdrop, in around a quarter of our case studies in the current mapping, much more active constructions of publics as activists, as active communities, and as active citizens are evident. This emphasizes the political activist and potential of publics, marked by the emergence of multiple activist mobilizations at the national and local levels. This demonstrates the ability of citizens take action on their own and in their communities to address problems of energy, climate change, and at zero, for example, through community energy projects. And active communities themselves are the second highest number of cases in the current corpus, as demonstrated by this graph here. In an actual, therefore, this mapping analysis warns that the challenge of representing and engaging the public is more difficult than assuming popular approaches to public opinion and behavior change. It is crucial that existing approaches to public engagement and decision-making around energy, climate change, and net zero better attend to these diverse publics, their views and actions. And this is crucial in achieving just transitions that, that, that can better account for these different types of publics and their views as well as we will see in a minute. Research now that underpins the public engagement observatory approach also shows that what publics say and do is shaped by the ways in which they engage. Thus, it is not surprising that the plural publics we identified earlier on and different forms of engagement 
also bring forward a diverse range of public issues, views, and actions on energy, climate change, or net zero. Specifically, as shown in this slide, what people are engaging spans across at least 27 different aspects or objects of engagement, which led to four broader themes, climate change and decarbonization, energy systems, energy and society, and water sustainability issues and concerns. A key development in the current mapping phase has been the significant increase in energy related public engagement on wider aspects of climate change and decarbonization. Climate change was the focus of engagement in most cases across the whole corpus, in 44 cases in specific. In parallel, public engagement with diverse aspects of energy systems continues to be prevalent. Energy related objects and issues that are more immediate, close to home, and visible feature more predominantly, such as public engagement around renewables, transport and mobility, energy demand and energy efficiency, domestic heating and cooling practices, and smart technologies. In contrast, other aspects of energy systems that are a bit more distant from people's everyday life, like fracking, energy infrastructures, energy market, markets, and nuclear power, were fewer in number. Importantly, though, we also see the increasing visibility of engagements which focus more explicitly on those social aspects of energy and climate change. This includes engagements which, which focus on matters of concern in relation to energy justice, in relation to energy democracy, energy poverty and affordability, in relation to community energy, etc. Etc. And importantly, one further dimension is engagements with energy technologies in everyday life. This trends towards public engagement focused on social aspects demonstrates, in other words, how low carbon transitions are increasingly seen as socio technical and not purely as technological challenges. And last but not least, and interestingly, our mapping results also show the relevance of non-energy energy participation. That is instances where public engagements focus on objects that are seemingly outside, but beyond the scope of energy, but directly impact upon energy and climate systems as well, including sustainability and biodiversity, sustainable living and environmental protection in general terms. This shows, in other words, how energy and low carbon transitions are inexorably linked with a broader nexus of concerns, beliefs, and actions. And this includes as well more radical objects of engagement. In other words, and to summarize this slide, what our mapping illustrates is that no single form or process of public engagement can capture the multiple public views and actions on energy, climate change, or net zero once and for all. Every instance of participation is partial and framed in particular ways, as shown by this figure. Importantly, though, we found that the more institution-led cases to the left of the mapping space we introduced earlier on often more narrowly framed problems in instrumental, technical, and economic terms, whereas the more citizen-led engagements to the right of the mapping space we showed earlier on raise concerns and bring about actions focused on issues of equity, justice, of more radical social change, of alternative models uh, to economic law, and so on and so forth. So, now having introduced our key findings, I'd now like to hand back to, to Jason for some initial reflections around the implications of these mappings we've been conducting coll uh, collectively as an observatory team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felia. So um, I'm now going to just go and, as Felia says, now reflect on um, some of these findings. Based on these findings, our briefing sets out four key areas of insight 
and recommendation. And the first is that uh, we need to recognize diverse public engagements with energy, climate change, and net zero. So while mainstream approaches often assume that the public lack knowledge or are disengaged, our analysis shows that publics are already engaged in so many different ways around energy and climate change. And this should actually be the starting point, not an afterthought when approaching public engagement on these issues. As Felius has, has talked about, our analysis shows that different forms of public engagement shape what people say and do about energy and climate change in different ways. Citizen-led engagements bring forward alternative public concerns and actions compared to those that are institution-led. So relying on discrete or single engagement processes will always exclude or miss important public concerns that need to be recognized and taken into account. So it's therefore crucial that policy, innovations, and participation for energy and climate change becomes much more responsive to the views and actions of diverse publics and their engagement, such as the ones that we've shown through this mapping. The second uh, recommendation is that we should attend to public engagements as continually emerging, interrelating and excluded. The discrete one-off basis of many existing processes creates a snapshot of public engagement in specific moments in time. Our mappings challenge this relatively static view by showing how public engagements with energy and climate change are always ongoing, emergent, and in flux. What our mappings also reveal is how public engagements never occur in isolation. It shows how they're always interacting and interrelating in a wider ecology of participation. And we suggest that attending to public engagement in this interrelated and systemic way can create new opportunities. It can create synergies between public engagements that could better could be better harnessed to enhance citizen responses to net zero transitions. Having a more comprehensive understanding of what publics are saying and doing can improve evident, evidence bases for decision making. Our mappings also highlight, as Felix has shown, that there are inequalities and exclusions, not just within individual engagement processes, but occurring at a more systemic level. And this raises wider questions about who holds the power and resources in the wider system of public engagement and whether or how this might be redistributed. Third, we make a call for moving towards systems of public engagement. The current public engagement landscape is very much geared towards discrete forms of participation working in isolation. The different forms of public engagement that were revealed in our mapping, all of those individual forms of public engagement are most often treated separately in terms of say their institutional arrangements, how they're resourced, their skills, their methods, how they're studied, how their quality might be evaluated. So our analysis suggests that uh, more systemic approaches are required that encompass different forms of participation across issues, organizations, sectors, and wider systems. And this actually can mean that we need to do quite a lot differently. It demands new organizational institutional forms. It demands more strategic approaches to systemic engagement across organizations, countries, or even internationally. It means perhaps directing funding and resourcing of engagement to more cross-cutting distributed or citizen-led initiatives. It can change how we think about the quality or how we evaluate participation and public engagement and to try and do this in more systemic terms. Building capacities in systemic approaches to engagement is also important. Um, but also this means moving from seeing public engagement not only as supporting specific centralized decisions, but also as inherent to the distributed governance of energy and net zero transitions. And finally, in our briefing, we say a few words about observatories and mapping participation for innovation, policy, innovation and society. We see observatories as one example of new entities and organizational forms 
that can advance and support these moves to more systemic approaches to public engagement. Observatories and methods for mapping participation should be set up and experimented with in practice to support policy innovations and new forms of participation. This can occur at the level of individual organizations. It can occur at, say, the level of national or regional government, or potentially it could occur at a more global scale. So to help advance this, we as the observatory are undertaking a series of collaborative experiments with partner organizations in the UK and overseas that will form the focus of future observatory briefings and events. A final word though on our public engagement observatory website, where we openly share an, an interactive online data set of diverse cases of public engagement with energy and climate change occurring between 2010 and the current day. This is a resource that can be used to explore and better appreciate and account for diverse forms of public engagement with energy and climate change. And we also have a contribute function on our, on our website um, where we welcome um, the contribution and suggestions of additional cases of public engagement with energy and climate change that aren't currently within the data set. So please take a look. The, the web uh, address is there, ukirk-observatory.ac.uk. Uh, please take a look and, and get involved. So we're now moving, uh, that, that concludes uh, the, the, the presentation from the observatory team, um, the findings of our, our new mapping and some of the implications of that and recommendations. So we're now gonna move to um, two speakers uh, who are gonna offer insights from their perspective on, on the analysis and the recommendations. Uh, our first uh, speaker is Claire Melia. And Claire is uh, the Knowledge and Practice Lead at the ISWI Foundation, and she is a facilitator, process designer, and researcher with expertise in delivering participatory processes that put citizens at the heart of decision making. And Claire was, um, in 2022, in collaboration with other partners, she launched the Global Assembly on Climate and the Ecological Crisis ahead of COP26. Thank you very much, Jason, and good to uh, connect um, with the audience. I will um, probably not do justice to the findings in five minutes, so I decided to focus my reflections um, on two aspects, particularly of your research, which is the, the who, the audience, uh, the diversity of publics that you've um, explained um, so far, and also the, the what, uh, and by that I mean the, the topics that are coming up uh, as of interest um, in, um, in your research. Um, and just briefly to add um, to what Jason said, I was a uh, researcher with CAS, the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformation at Cardiff University, and we did some research back in 2021 comparing Climate and the UK and the French process, the Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat. Uh, so my my recent experience in deliberative processes has been both coming from the perspective as a practitioner, but also as a researcher. And uh, a lot of the findings we did uh, with the research we did back in 2021 are very aligned with the research findings that uh, your team is coming up with. Um, so I'll just share briefly my screen to show. Um, the, the report that I just mentioned, which was uh, a report um, comparing climate and the UK and the French process. And in terms of um, how this research has shaped um, the, the, how I personally approach deliberative processes now is rooted in what I would say, um, an analysis of power and theories of change. Um, a lot of deliberative processes have been framed as having some kind of neutral framing to some extent. Um, but what we 
have found that uh, through our research, and we're about to publish with CAST actually uh, this later this month, a follow-up briefing which is looking at systems change and citizens' assemblies and whether citizens' assemblies are actually mechanisms for addressing sy systemic um, level challenges. Um, and this research briefing is really exploring in more depth um, what we what the theories of change of of um, deliberative processes and i think the the power cube that um uh, professor gaventa uh, has used in the past is really helpful to ex to try to explore uh, what are the spaces of um, uh, engagement? And that's what your research is showing in your uh, figure three, uh, page eight of your report, which is whether they are orchestrated by institution or, or more by citizens. And this is what um, he, here we can describe as either more closed, invited or claimed spaces. I think that's really helpful to think of engagement uh, through the lens of who commissions, who initiates, who frames the debate, um, because this has consequences for um, the forms of power, which uh, Gavanta describes as visible, hidden, or, or invisible. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen now to just go into a bit more of the depth of what I mean by that, because I think a lot of um, there are assumptions made around, especially uh, mini publics, that they uh, they they will lead to change, and it's a theory of change that tends to be quite linear, and that assume that if you've got a mandate from a power holder, that will lead to more, that will be more likely to lead to to change. But what our research is finding um, with CAST is that actually you need to think about theories of change in a more systemic way and who frames the debate and who has the, the power to change. And it's not just in terms of policy makers, you need to think about all the uh, other agents of change. And this is why I think the, the, the graph that you, you, are, you have described earlier, uh, Phidias, is really helpful because change can happen being led by citizens themselves. It doesn't have to only be uh, power holders initiating these processes. So I think that's, um, that's one aspect in terms of the diversity of the publics. I think that's what your research is showing uh, really well and is helping us think through um, you know, what are theories of change and how, how change happens. Um, the second aspect is around the what and the, the topics that um, are covered. Um, although you're saying that there were 27 objects of engagement so you, that you, you classify in, in uh, different categories, um, I was surprised by two elements actually. Um, and the first one was the, the lack of reference to adaptation and resilience in relation to climate change. And maybe it's a question um, that will um, uh, relate to the coding and how the research was done. But I was quite surprised to not see uh, any topics related to um, uh, yeah, adaptation and resilience and how people relate to climate change, not just from a mitigation perspective, but also in the face of climate impacts. What does that mean for communities, for instance, um, in terms of water scarcity and, and resources and, and food sovereignty, for instance? And this is something at the moment that is quite uh, acute in France. Um, uh, where there's there, there's a, a lot of debate around, for instance, water uh, resources management and water scarcity, and which is directly connected to the climate climate topic, climate change impacts. Um, so I was that was one reflection in terms of your research. Uh, how does you know adaptation and resilience um, would be captured in potentially a, a future? Uh, iterations of this mapping um, and some people would say actually the topic even of collapse and how communities face 
um, potential co collapse scenario, um, how would that be taken into account? How would that be uh, coded? Um, so this is uh, one aspect. And the second element that I was interested in hearing maybe your reflection on are the um, the impact that, for instance, we've seen in, in um, recent months in the UK around the debate around ULES and uh, in the context of the by-election in, in Uxbridge, um, the, the connection to um, uh, lifestyles and freedoms and how people frame climate in terms of restrictions potentially around their their lifestyle and their freedom and um in uh, uh in your mapping when you were saying protests and activist groups more citizens led initiatives i was wondering if there was uh, an assumption there that it might be actually more, much more like green green activism and uh, pro climate activist strategies, but um, reflecting on what we've seen recently happening in, in the UK in the context of ULES, what are, are actually, uh, how are these potential topics and, and groups captured and how would you, again, in your coding and, and um, processes for future mapping, how would you uh, account for that? So um, in a nutshell, and I don't want to take any more time, but this was these were my my key reflections based on your research. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share. Thank you so much, Claire. That's amazing. And um, we will hold on to your points and come back to them in a moment in the plenary. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Patrick Devine Wright, who's a professor of human geography at the University of Exeter. Patrick's also director of the Access Network leadership team funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. And Access stands for Advancing Capacity in Climate and Environment Social Science. Patrick, as I'm sure many of you will already know, has published widely on many aspects of public engagement with energy and climate change. So over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Jason, and for the invitation to be part of this uh, webinar today. And uh, it's great to see so many participants online as well. Fantastic. Great to see so much interest. Um, yeah, I'm aware the time is ticking away, so I'm going to try not to spend uh, too much time. Um, but I do have a few thoughts to share. I mean, just to describe where I'm coming from as well, as the director of a, an ESRC initiative like Access, I, I think it's fantastic to see uh, uh, environmental social science in an interdisciplinary context like the UK Energy Research Centre uh, and some very policy and society societally relevant findings. So I uh, just want to applaud the team and uh, look forward to seeing how Access can support the work you're doing. But I think it's great to see. Um, I mean, I've been involved in, in a variety of, uh, I suppose, um, institutions that are relevant to this topic. Um, I helped to advise the Devon Citizens Climate Assembly that took place two years ago. And I've also been involved in the IPCC in the last assessment round. And I think the um, understanding of the various types of public engagements that are relevant to climate mitigation in particular are just beginning to have a significant um, input into IPCC understandings around climate mitigation. So uh, chapter five that I was involved in last time around did talk about collective action. It talked about social movements, and activism, um, Friday strikers, etc. And it also talked about the rise of public deliberation um, and, and direct engagement with citizens and the enabling of, of hopefully transformations of policy in that realm. So I, it is great to see the kind of holistic and longitudinal assessment of changes in engagement practices over time that this report provides. And in that sense, I fully applaud the decision of UKIRP to build this kind of obs observatory kind of institutional format that's likely to be beyond any particular researcher or research team. And it's really important to get that bigger picture assessment. As academics, I think... Um, we're all familiar with just how much stuff is being published nowadays. It's almost impossible to keep up. So we really need reviews. We need systematic reviews. Um, and this kind of assessment of changes and trends over time is extremely useful as well to see past that detail and, and the press of publication. So I applaud it. Um, it's also a really important topic. Um, those of us who take a socio-technical approach 
recognize that um, net zero and climate mitigation, et cetera, is not going to be achieved purely through technological fixes. So the idea of a socio-technical perspective and the relevance of public engagement as part of that is an extremely important thing to emphasize through this research and the work of UKIRK. And of course, we could see an awful lot more, I think, from the UK government in terms of putting in place an effective strategy around public engagement with net zero in particular. And we see differences in the policy approaches in different governments across the UK. So hopefully this will inform that. And I welcome hearing that uh, the team from UKIRC are directly engaging with central government departments and hope that that will uh, prove an impactful relationship over time. I don't know if to be slightly depressed though, in some senses, you know, when I hear um, great social scientists talking about the pluralities of public and uh, the different forms of public engagement. It prompted me last week to go back to a paper that Gordon Walker published in 1995 in Land Use Policy, talking about renewable energy and the public, and really questioning 30 years ago what we mean by the public. And the, the fact that we need to continually emphasize the plurality of publics and the plurality of engagements is something that I, I think we just have to accept, but um, I have to say I'm not, it, it doesn't make me feel uh, superb and, and wonderful about uh, the impact that the social sciences have had over the last 30 years, or maybe in, in fact it shows the the challenges involved in changing those deeply, deeply uh, set narratives around technological change and what transition looks like. Uh, it certainly uh, suggests that we, we still have considerable work to do collectively in that area and the work of Susan Owens and others in particular around uh, knowledge deficits, information deficits uh, um, held by public. So this kind of work that challenges that continually emphasizes the plurality of publics is certainly to be welcomed. I just have a few things to finish on then that um, I, I could would like to bring to the attention based of the team, based on the report. That could be fruitful uh, future directions, and, and maybe you're already doing this, and, and I just didn't see it in the details. But I do think that um, looking at the relations between the different engagement methods and mechanisms and options is a very fruitful journey to take. Uh, when I was involved in the Devon Climate Assembly, it became quite clear that policy support for citizen deliberation in that context, led by the local authority and a partnership, had been prompted by direct activism of, of, of teenagers on the streets. So there is no doubt at all that, that these different forms of engagements by publics, some of which are institution-led, some of which are community or public-led, they interrelate in very interesting and complex ways. And it would be very interesting to see some attempt to do path analysis Analysis or causal chains or temporal, temporal analyses of how they interrelate over time in some kind of interesting and sophisticated way. Jason mentioned that wider ecology, and it'd be great to see that in a little bit more detail. Um, the second point I wanted to make was about temporality. And, and it is really great to see the comparison between 2010 and 2015 um, in the report, and, and more recently, the seven-year period, 2015 to 22. That kind of uh, assessment of change over time is incredibly informative. But I do think that the uh, ways in which publics engage on social media more recently give us the opportunity to look at even more kind of micro scale temporalities of public engagement on social media around these topics of energy and climate change. So I just wanted to very briefly share a slide, just a single slide of a a uh, finding from uh, a recent project I was involved with, with some great colleagues from um, different universities around the country, um, which was about shale gas and fracking. And, and really the point I want to make in this slide is that we have the opportunity through the analysis of social media data to really show the uh, changes and the spikes in engagement in very, very short timescales um, over days or weeks. So you can see these are shale gas related events uh, like um, uh, a seismic event in, in, in Lancashire, for example, and how they, they lead to sudden engagements by publics uh, using social media, using internet searches, for example. And these can be traced over time um, and, and analyzed in some depth through research. So um, this, this was something that we brought together with other kinds of data sets, uh, qualitative local case study data and nationally representative samples. So I don't think these are mutually exclusive 
methodological techniques of tracking engagement over time. But I do think we can do something not, not only about kind of broader temporalities of changes in engagement forms, but also maybe at a more micro level, uh, what's happening across several hours or minutes or days of a weekend um, in, in ways that simply might not have been feasible before using conventional methods. So I'll get rid of that and then just finish with one or two brief points. Um, there is uh, some very interesting detail on who's engaging in the report. I did wonder, though, more about ethnicity, about class, about gender. Um, is it possible to bring those kind of traditional sociological categories of social groupings more to the fore so that we know who's engaging? There's, there's, there's I suppose, anecdotal evidence that uh, well-resourced middle-class communities are often engaged more strongly around preventing unwanted developments like fracking in their areas. How much can the observatory pick up on that in a kind of evidence-based way? And then finally, I think, as Claire pointed out, um, there's an increasing sense that the uh, environmental crisis exists alongside the climate crisis, and therefore looking at engagement with climate and energy and net zero, what can we say from this kind of data set in relation to engagements that are nature focused or uh, land use change focused, the kind of broader biodiversity concerns that people have, and trying to stitch those things together in a slightly broader picture too, because they're certainly connected, even if uh, sometimes things are energy specific or technology specific, but often they aren't too. So just a few things there, but but great work and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for those reflections. Um, really valuable. Lots of great suggestions on future directions, as well as um, connections with existing programs like Access and the importance of emphasizing diverse publics. Um, I'm just going to answer a few because I think some of them are just quick questions of clarification. Some of those things we're kind of doing, I'll just use it as an opportunity to flag that up. Then I'm going to ask Phidias to, to respond to um, some of the points that have been raised. And hopefully in our last six or seven minutes, we'll have time to take at least one or two questions from the audience. Um, so um, I'll probably work backwards, actually. Uh, we totally agree about the importance of linking energy and climate change with wider environmental um, biodiversity, uh, ecological crises. Um, what's been really interesting is the Natural England came to us and said, hey, we like the idea of that observatory. Can we set one up in, in Natural England and do an observatory on nature and biodiversity? So we've been working with them for two, for two years and it's currently taken the form of a, a laboratory for public engagement with nature and society. And this is something that's actually going on within the organization at like, quite a practical level. So that's been uh, very exciting. We completely agree uh, the importance of digital methods, um, repurposing online platforms, Twitter, uh, Google. Um, we've been doing this work probably at a less intensive level within the observatory, but it's definitely a strand of our work. So on our website, I think the, le the link to our website's been put into the, the channel, um, uh, the, the question answer channel. Um, yeah, we, we, we totally agree. We, We've, we've done some of that work and we, we agree also that one of the interesting things is the micro dimension and the different temporalities, but also how digital methods might then inter interface with in an interdisciplinary way with other methods like um, our comparative case analysis we talked about today and crowdsourcing. Um, and yes, I think there was a, another maybe a point around um, questions of uh, immediate uh, clarification, although I can't I can't think of them right now. Um, so I'm going to just prompt Phidias. Phidias, I think we've uh, there's been a few questions that have come up. I think Claire has asked around adaptation and on the what. Maybe there's some framings that um, we that might be in the data set that haven't been emphasised or or could be a feature of future analysis. Um, and also, I think. Um, let me just uh, recap. Um, yeah, maybe there's a question. Um, yeah, maybe start with that one, and then we can we can maybe come back with a few other points. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I'll start with a disclaimer. The very fact that we are, we are part of the UK Energy Research Center inevitably means that our focus, our starting point, has today always been energy related issues and actually in previous mappings we only focus on stuff related explicitly 
to energy and the energy transition. Uh, it was only during this mapping that we started opening up to broader issues around climate change uh, and sustainability in broad terms uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the kind of uh, clear surprise in something around climate adaptation and resilience being absent from the database, uh, I guess there's, there's two aspects to this. First of all, from a coding point of view, uh, I would suggest that some issues relating to adaptation and resilience are captured under that broader code of sustainability, sustainable living, and basically within that broader category of non-energy, energy engagements. Secondly, however, given exactly this starting point of the observatory being part of Newkirk and energy being the, our immediate focus of attention, I would I would definitely agree with Claire that if we're thinking across across the broader economies of participation around climate change, perhaps our current database underrepresents uh, these engagements. We do include some of them uh, in under the codes around sustainability and non-energy energy specific engagements. Uh, but still, I would say that overall, perhaps there's more work to be done in being further inclusive of this broader uh, public engagements around the climate crisis. Great. Thanks, Phidias. Um, I'm conscious of time and we've had a rich uh, set of you know, presentations, comments. Um, and I, th I think it's going to be difficult now for us to take um, questions from the audience. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes um, keeping the panel discussion going um, and um, maybe um, referring to a couple of points that were made um, by our panelists. Um, Claire, you talked about um, the, this question of clarification that we get a lot in the observatory, which is the citizen led stuff around activism and protest. Is that just kind of activism protest for positive social change to kind of address climate the climate crisis? Our answer will be no, it's not just that. We also include the sorts of things that you're alluding to, where there might be groups that might be skeptical about some of the um, actions that are being uh, taken and, and policies around climate change at, and net zero, etc. And so there are some examples of those sorts of cases in the data set. So we feel that's important in terms of being opening up to diversity of engagements. And on the ecology point, yeah, Patrick, that's really um, a great point. And it's something that we have done a little bit of work on trying to um, look at these interrelations. And we do have a paper back in, I think, 2018 on the ecology of participation that sort of has a typology of these different forms of interaction. But it's great to hear that that's kind of something that you see in your experience um, sort of working at a local level. Um, where citizens' assemblies and other deliberative processes are kind of sparked into action um, by that kind of pressure and activist uh, uh, movements that might be going on so-called outside. Um, I'm conscious that now we're, we're just about out of time. Um, so it just leaves me to, to just say a huge thanks to Claire and Patrick for coming on today, sharing their insights, um, giving us some food for thought and some brilliant questions to take forward and also some, some very positive comments uh, as well. Um, I'm just gonna reshare the slides to uh, move towards um, the final slide, uh, which um, says these are the ways in which you can, you can get in touch with us. So we encourage you to um, you know, get, get in touch with us at the, at the, through those channels, um, get on the observatory website and uh, tell us about cases that might be missing from our data sets. Um, and do get in touch with us if, if you'd like to know more about the work that we're doing. We would like to thank the UK HQ team for supporting us today and putting on this webinar. We look forward to seeing you again at um, our observatory events in the future. Thanks so much for coming along.